the second time I go to Arthur's house, my father-in-law, after we've been going out now for two years, he takes me diving. He tells me he's going to take me to the seawall. I ask him, the what? He says, oh, the seawall. Th this makes no sense to me at all. I mean, there's a wall in the sea. It drops down hundreds of feet. I had no idea the bed of the sea was built like that. I thought it was a gradual slope. And, and he takes us to the wall and swimming there with the sun bright as it is above us. And it is a bright day. Even then, the darkness of the fall that the wall and the sea reveals is as terrifying as anything I've seen. We go there to his house for our holidays every year. We did used to drive three years straight and we drove all the way down from London without stopping. We took it in turns driving. We kind of promised to share the navigating, but neither of us needed any help. We did it fine. When Lucy was born, we started flying there though, because the driving is not fair on a baby. And he'd buy us the tickets. You can get flights to Cacassons for dead cheap, but he'd pay for us to fly into Nice and he'd hire us a car when we got there. The first time he sees her, he takes her by surprise a bit. He, he looms over behind her and he's got these glasses, these, these big old glasses. And he's a very, very tall man. And he sneaks up behind her and, and she screams like living shit, believe me. It took her about three weeks to recover from that. But she did. And then she'd start with the shuffling across the floor to reach him and, and putting her hands out and making these little noises that basically mean, put me in your lap and read me a story, you funny old fucker. I don't care if you're meant to be weird. I don't care if you're meant to be scary. I don't care what anybody fucking thinks about you. I want a story and I want it now. And who could resist that? She's clever. She, she's, she's eight. We've been going every year. We talked for years about having a second child, but every time we think about it, we just think about Lucy and we think, you know, we're very happy. It's just, we just want her. She's clever, she's funny. She's very, very pretty. She's Helen's sidekick. She's my sweetheart. They make little wisecracks about me. The two of them stand there sizing me up, but I know that if they push it too far that she'll come running over to me and put her arms around me because the idea of properly making me sad makes her feel a bit sick. In the eight years that she's been born, I've fucked a lot of things up and somehow by the skin of my teeth, managed to come out largely unscathed. <laughs> Five weeks ago, just before we go, just before all the packing and the frantic stuff about what we're going to take, Helen is buying some stuff to take with us. She's got Lucy, her dresses and her toys and her books and her coffee and the stuff for the flight. She's got me some shades, which were properly pucker. Seriously, very uh, puncherello from Chips. And she asks me to come into the bedroom because there's something she wants to show me. And I get there. And she's wearing this dress. This blue dress. Just dropped back. And she asks me to tell her what I think. <laughs> and I swear, for 30 seconds, I couldn't speak. She looked. <laughs> And the thought that I was married to her and that we had our girl and that this was our life. <laughs> when we get there, Helen has to go to the supermarket because she wants to get some bread and some shampoo for Lucy and I need some athlete's foot cream. And we love, they have these little yogurts, these little pots of 
vanilla flavored yogurt that you can't get in Britain. And she wants to get some cheese. It, it's fun getting it from the market, but as it goes, it's a proper ripoff. So she wants to go to the supermarket, which is where most of the French people go anyway. So me and Arthur and Lucy uh, go down to the sea. Um, there's this bay just near his house and around the corner from the bay is this little cove that you can actually climb onto. And when the bay's busy, you can go to this cove and it's, it's actually nearer his house and it's very quiet and it's lovely and it's secluded and, and we decide to go there. She can go into this little world. You ever know any kids like that? When she thinks nobody's looking, she can just start going further and further into her imagination, playing games all by herself. Actually, what she's really doing is she's talking to herself, which some people might find a bit disconcerting, but I just love to watch her. Arthur goes for a swim. I'm reading L.A. Noir, the bit where the cop and the killer and the deserted car park at midnight, neither knowing whether the other one is there. Lucy is playing behind me, running around a bit, being a Power Ranger. The sun is gorgeous. I've got my shades on. It's so bright. He comes back. The water is amazing, he says. He dries off. I notice his feet, the skin on his feet is unusually battered and cracked. It's one of those moments you kind of rumble, he's a little old. He tells me I can go for a swim. <laughs> and, and I do. And the water is uh, amazing. I wade past the first bank, get past all the seaweed. I swim out and out and out around the bay and the light. At that time of day, the light on the Mediterranean is just, and the sea is warm. I turn around and about 20 yards out. I can see the houses on the top of the road. I can see his house. I can see the swimmers around the corner of the bay. I can see Arthur sitting, reading, reading some history of China. He's really into it. I can see Lucy playing behind him playing Power Rangers. I can see this all, all clearly. And I watch them as she does a little bit of a jump. And, and he doesn't notice at first because he's so into his book that she loses her footing on the sand and the gravel of the rock. And, and, and she kind of slips and stumbles and, and in trying to correct her balance, she actually puts more weight on her back foot, which slips out from underneath her. And, and, and it's weird to look at because she does fall off the edge of this six foot high cliff and, and she cracks her head against some rocks which are jutting out at the bottom of the cliff. I can see this all with real detail, but I can't really hear anything. And it's weird watching it with no sound. Like when the sound's off on the TV, it's always a bit strange. The, the, this all takes a while to register before I turn and, and swim back to shore. And, and I'm not thinking, so I'm swimming faster and faster and faster, which is stupid because I'm panicking. And, and when you panic, you can't really breathe properly. So I tell myself, just focus on your breathing. I kind of watch him between strokes. He's thrown down his book and, and run over to where she is. And there's this other couple, which I hadn't noticed at first, which are, have stopped their sunbathing and, and gone over to her. And I notice him pick her up. He's torn between running back to the house to call an ambulance and waiting for me. I get there in enough time for him not to have to worry about this for too long. I go to her, I take her from him. I notice what there is, which is weird to me, is there's a handful of blood in her hair. It's all thick and matted in her, and her hair's all chewed up by it.
I read that it's a, a process. That it's never absolutely instantaneous. The injury causes the death of brain cells, so signals are no longer sent to the lungs and bit by bit the machine closes down. Her blood sticks to my hands. I carry her up the path of the cove and I hadn't bothered getting dried off and people are watching me, stopping still in their tracks and, and talking to me in French and I'm, I'm aware that I'm, I'm kind of not crying. I, I look like, uh, fuck, I, I don't know. And as I'm carrying her into the house and, and through the sliding glass door, I kind of bang her head again, a, a bit against the wall and I tell her I'm sorry, which is stupid, but... But there's a part of me that's thinking, well, fuck it now. What does it fucking matter now? May as well drag her by her fucking ankle. This bit of meat, this bit of... Meat and air. And I remember I was a bit astonished because one of the ambulance men spoke English. Quite good English. And, and I couldn't... And he had lived in Southampton. And I couldn't help thinking, why the fuck did you live in Southampton of all places? the sound of her coming through the door with her bags full of bread and cheese and yogurt takes me completely by surprise. She looks at me across his house. She's wearing sunglasses to protect her from the light. He's sitting on his sofa. He is a man that is completely broken. He's a shattered form, the little noises he makes. I lean over the desk at the check-in at Nice, and we'd been taken to the front of the line and <laughs> we'd actually be given an upgrade. And while the woman was there sorting all this out, I'm looking over her at the sheet. She's checking off on her desk and there's a list of the passengers and the crew and the baggage. And at the end of the list, it read, human remains, which was a bit. We're sitting, the three of us in the departure lounge. Can't really touch one another. Can't look at each other or at anybody else. I turn to him. And this is the cruelest thing I ever did to anybody else. And don't forget, this is a man I, I you know, I've known him for 10 years and I, I, I do. I love him. I look at him. I say to him, You get back to London, of course, and the noise of the place, and the dirt and the color and the roar of it, it's just, I can't actually, <laughs> what I can't do. I have a complete and total inability to cry. You hear people and they say to you that they can't imagine not believing in anything because it would be just too depressing. I think there's something sick about that. The level of cowardice in that is just unbearable to me. I've been home for three weeks. If this can happen, anything can happen. <laughs>